parents. I'm Robin Peters Bennett. I'm the founder of StopSpanking.org. I'm so excited to be here today. I myself am a trauma therapist. I work with children who are dysregulated and also adults who suffer from the long and enduring effects of early abuse and neglect. And I'm so happy to be here with Dr. Stephen Porges and Amy Bryant. We're going to be talking about the sound protocol and how this wonderful technology can help us become more socially engaged and can help our children feel better in their bodies and connect to us better and cope with life and feel good. So I want to just start with introducing Dr. Stephen Porges. He's a distinguished university scientist at Indiana University, where he is the founding director of Traumatic Stress Research Consortium. He's the professor of psychiatry at the University of North Carolina and professor emeritus of the University of Illinois in Chicago, as well as the University in Maryland. Dr. Porges has served as president for the Society for Psychophysiological Research and the Federation of Associations in Behavioral and Brain Sciences. He's a former recipient of the National Initi Institute of Mental Health Research Scientist Development Award. Dr. Porges has published more than 300 peer-reviewed articles, and in 1994, he proposed and pioneered the polyvagal theory. Uh, and we've actually had the gift of interviewing Dr. Porges uh, several years ago on that, and I encourage you to watch it. It's fascinating. It has so many applications in so many venues. Um, this theory links the evolution of the mammalian autonomic nervous system to social behavior and emphasizes the importance of the physiological state in the expression of behavioral problems and psychiatric disorders. And I'd further say that it helps us understand how we're able to be with each other and tolerate each other and form empath empathic relationships. Um, Amy Bryant is a good friend and a wonderful parenting educator. She is a psychotherapist who specializes in trauma and positive parenting in Atlanta, Georgia. Her practice is wild child counseling, and she's also uh, the admin and founder of Parenting Beyond Punishment, which is a marvelous Facebook page and also website with, um, she has this wonderful online group to help parents who are really striving to be uh, practice the principles of positive parenting without punishment or reward. It's a great resource uh, and support for parents. Good morning. Good morning. And thank you, Robin. And thank you, Laura, for Amy, for inviting me here uh, to be on again. I recall our earlier uh, dialogue. And um, let's, let's go on with some open-ended questions. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Yep. So where do you want to begin? <laughs> Thing. I actually would start off by asking uh, people if they've ever won an argument. Uh, and I think that would kind of set the, the uh, substrate of what we're talking about is that when you fight and have arguments, there is never a winner. Oh, and wow. it's, it's really because when we get into arguments, our physiological state changes and we become very defensive and protect ourselves. Now, that doesn't stop us as parents or teachers to uh, trying to use the same techniques that we know will not work with us on our children and our students. Um, but when we shift our state, meaning when we get defensive, we lose a lot of our capacity to not only regulate our body, but also to recruit our intellectual capacities. We become li literally less smart in, in our decision-making and our behaviors. And so the whole theme of what it is, uh, is to make people feel safe so that they can recruit all the resources that evolved with being a human. And those resources are great. And so it really means that our mission on, in our lives is to create safe, connecting, re connected relationships. Mm -hmm. We need to have the, the opportunities to trust others. And, and as you start talking about the issues of abuse and trauma, if you think about what, what abuse, neglect, and trauma do, they make it impossible for a person to trust another. And it has nothing to do with intentions. And this is really what I want to get into is that we think that we can tell people what to do or we can reward them or punish them and they'll do what we want them to do. But in a sense, their body knows better. Their body says, 
I feel safe. I can uh, be, uh, I can be hugged. I can be close to another person, or my body feels like it's under threat, and I'll pull back, or dissociate. So the issue is we have to understand that even though we walk around as if we have a mind, our mind is not independent of our body's reactions. It's actually being driven by it. And in the culture that we've been in, the I would say, the several hundred years of Western civilization, where did we put our bodily feelings? We spent our time rejecting them, uh, not making them relevant. Uh, and I kind of play with this concept of what if uh, Descartes was mistranslated, that he didn't really say, <laughs> I think, therefore I am. But he said in the French, uh, je, uh, let's see. Je, uh, je, je me sens, I feel my body, uh, donc je suis, therefore I am, I, I'm real. But oh, wow. it's the reflexive use of feeling one's body. Mm. But even in English, we have the word feeling, and that is to touch an object or an internal feeling. We don't know what people mean when they use that word. Yes. Fortunately, in French, there's a reflexive form of the word feel. It means feeling oneself. Mm. And in the world of trauma, people don't feel themselves, but in the world that most of us have been brought up into, what were we instructed to do? Not feel ourselves. Yes, and so, it's also safe, you know, not to feel like most people that have had a trauma history, mm. being in the body is alarming, it's strange, or they don't even have the language to, to describe it. That's right. Um, I was working with an autistic adult, this is about 20 years ago, and I was using the, the listening protocol, the safe and sound protocol, when I was developing it. And he had totally changed. And I asked him how he felt. And he couldn't find the word. Yeah. It, it was a long delay. And they said, more relaxed. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah. You know what I love, too, about your ideas? And they're a huge shift, I think, for people as they begin to understand it. Because I think understanding your ideas is also having a physical experience of what it is to know your body. Mm -hmm. So this is an integrated learning. It's not something just to conceptually grasp. But the idea that our behavior is emergent from our state mm -hmm. and not learned in sort of a cognitive way, but it's, um, it's naturally uh, sort of blooms out of this state mm. of safety. You know, just think if it were learned, there'd be no autism, there'd be no uh, oppositional behavior, you know, everything would be totally uh, reinforced and controlled through reinforcement models, yeah. but it doesn't work. Mm. So it's not that those technologies aren't useful, but they're not useful for many of the behaviors we would like to modify. So it, it requires a major paradigm shift. And that paradigm shift is really that our physiological state provides basically neural platforms or platforms for a variety of emergent behaviors. So if we want people to be loving, social, listening, and attached to others, their bodies better be in a safe physiological state. Yeah. And yelling at a person, say, be safe, is just, just going to create the opposite. So if you want, in a sense, if you want the loving part of the person to come out, don't threaten them. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. And that can be so hard for people who want to not be threatening, but that is where their physiological state is. Too. Oh, if a person is, let's say, has a flat face and doesn't have cues of loving and caring to the other person, uh, the person who's trying to be supportive, their physiological state has reacted to the cues of the person they're trying to help because their body just doesn't feel supported. Um, when you deal with like uh, kids or families with autistic kids, you often hear parents talk about how much they love their kids, yeah. but they really don't like their child. You know, it's kind of a complex thing. They talk about love, but they feel difficult to connect or to attach even to the HIV, the AIDS population. And you hear similar things where uh, the caregiver will say that the, their uh, partner who has AIDS doesn't care about them. All they care about is being taken care of. But what most people don't realize is that the HIV virus is actually neurotoxic to the facial nerve. 
So oh, the gosh. upper part of the face starts to get flat. And wow. so when they look at people, uh, people with AIDS, they don't have the exuberance or the uh, excitement the, or love in the eyes, as we would say. Yeah, it makes me think about, I work quite a lot with families that have adopted children, either mm. out of the foster care system or from Ethiopia and China and abroad. And one of the things that happens when these children have had early trauma is that they don't reciprocate in the way that mm -hmm. your instinctual mother nature or father nature wishes for them and so uh, parents who want like with the sound protocol part of what i've been thinking about is how do i help um you know we want to bring the child's system online right and so yeah. that they can engage and all those things but when you've been with a child for a while who is constantly um shut down um, or aggressive or unresponsive, your own nervous system, you just feel frightened in your own body. Mm. So there's a lot of risk for parents to just come online and be available. Well, um, the, uh, the, there's a, uh, the magic word is reciprocity and the other magic word is synchrony. They are synchronous, that it's in real time and it's back and forth. But when parents deal with autistic kids, you just gave the one bit where the parent feels vulnerable. But we've had uh, instances where the child became available and open and spontaneously engaged after the safe and sound protocol, but the mother was flat face yes. and dissociative, yeah. and it triggered in the child panic and, and basically a tantrum. There's a parallel to this in a book written by a uh, school psychologist by the name of Claire Wilson. It's called Grounded. It's a small book, she, uh, but it describes teachers' experiences when they go into their classroom and their emotions, when they're dissociative, they had a bad day. Yeah. And the, their classes that day, the kids tend to be behaviorally out of control, mm -hmm. meaning that they are not there as support for the, for the children. And they are responding to their own memories and experiences. And now the triggers of the children are going to trigger them to be more in a sense, aggressive or appear to be aggressive to the children. Yeah. So I wondered if there was a way to begin to help. I wonder if there's a way to just sort of give pe people an overview of, you know, folks may or may not know what the polyvagal theory is that are listening, but like the polyvagal theory and specifically like, what is the sound protocol? It, because it's kind of a complicated idea. Well, okay. E everything starts somewhere. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's so comforting. We're, yeah, so we're, we're, we're going to go from the concrete to the elusive. So okay. um, we've already talked a bit about physiological state. And we can kind of describe the beginning physiological state where we feel like we have to run or fight or get the hell out of there. Or we have a physiological state where we just kind of like fall apart, collapse, dissociate and disappear, body numbness being part of it. Or we have a physiological state that has all these features of the face working, intonation of the voice, and our autonomic nervous system, our heart is being controlled uh, through mechanisms that are down-regulating our defenses. So we can think of three basic stages or states in our physiology, but those three states are actually following an evolutionary trajectory. That we start off with a autonomic nervous system that basically, uh, uh, when recruited in defense, shuts us down. So you can even think about primitive vertebrates when they're under uh, uh, fear or threat, they'll defecate, they'll shut down, and they'll stop breathing. So reptiles, when under threat, appear not to be alive. Now, yeah. humans have part of the same nervous system that other vertebrates have, including reptiles. That's our oldest circuit. And when we uh, are under uh, threat and we can't mobilize, can't fight or flee, which is a situation of small children uh, and large adults, then the system may have a, a, a propensity to shut down. It may do that initially. And then since it's potentially lethal to shut down because you're not getting enough oxygen to your brain, the nervous system is creative and adaptive. It says, okay, we won't put your cardiovascular system in that shock, 
because we don't want to have brain damage. But you know what we'll do? In, in a sense, it's going through these decisions, not in consciousness. This is how about if we take you to some place where you can't be touched, mm-hmm. meaning you 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 dissociate. Right. And this is what you frequently see. So think of dissociation, not as a disorder in itself, but as an adaptive adjustment so that you don't get, uh, your reactions don't injure you as much. Right. And one way that helps me think about dissociation, because some people are like, well, I, I didn't have that severe trauma. I don't, you know, there's a continuum. I mean, we all use dissociation yeah. all the time, yeah. right, in mild ways. But like, if it happens too much or it's too severe, then we can't reconnect easily and well i think the word the magic word was connect mm-hmm. so we dissociate to be uh, daydream to create to fantasize um we do that a lot we have this ability just to go into a world of thoughts and ideas mm-hmm. and visualizations mm-hmm. but we know when we're there versus when we're not there you know so we have boundaries and so we kind of wake up and say hi I, yeah. I, excuse me for uh, drifting <laughs> off Right. But when a person is dissociative, they're going to those states because there's threat in their environment. Mm-hmm. Or let's say the nervous system detects threat, even though threat may not be there. Mm-hmm. So you can be in, if you had severe trauma and abuse as a child, there may be a lower threshold to dissociate. Mm-hmm. And you may not even be aware that you're dissociating. So in the sense you may have body numbness. So the notion that you can sit in the classroom all day and do the rote tasks and get stars and A's Mm -hmm. uh, can also be uh, a person dissociative can do that because they're not reading any of their bodily feelings. They're not reading the feelings of other people. So uh, to kind of summarize, polyvagal theory talks about three different circuits that are physiological circuits that follow the evolutionary trajectory of vertebrates to become mammals. And mammals have some unique features. That is, they need other mammals in their life. Unlike reptiles that kind of uh, lay an egg, bury the egg, the egg catches and they scamper off and do their job. Uh, Mammals need other mammals for nurturance and for support. And for most mammals, they need other mammals throughout their life. So if we think about what is the greatest uh, fear that anyone has, it's isolation. It's, um, and isolation is the worst thing for a mammal. And any metaphor of isolation, which occurs with marginalization, bullying, uh, affects our physiology in the same way. We, we kind of go triggering to shutting down. So if we start talking a lot about children, that shutting down, that marginalization is always going to be reflected in their gut that because that's literally just, literally <laughs> yes uh so they're going to have gut problems mm-hmm. and they'll go to physicians and physicians will say there's nothing wrong uh yes. and they'll have chronic gut pains or irritable bowel they'll have diarrhea and constipation oscillating yes. and what that is telling you is that their nervous system is in states of defense they get mm-hmm. constipated because that facilitates fight flight mobilization. They get diarrhea because that's part of the shutting down response. Mm. So you can actually see it working out in front of you. But if they could recruit the part of the autonomic nervous system that keeps everything together, this is yeah. this more mammalian one, which deals with the face and the yes. voice. Uh, it also regulates the vagal regulation of the, of the heart. It gives signals to the gut saying, do your job. Everything's okay. Right. So um, it's not, you're not telling me everything's okay. My nervous system is going to tell me everything. That's okay. huge. That's huge. And you know, what's so interesting is that when I've done this sound protocol with parents first, before mm-hmm. their children, they become aware of everything you're speaking about. Like I've had people say, um, I don't think I've ever been in a state of safety. Yeah. So their physiology and they're functional people. They have jobs. They do great ah. things. It's not like they're d- disabled, um, but they are actually operating from a norm of being in a state of arousal or dissociation. Yeah, well, this is, you, 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 you pressed another button. You said the word, there's successful people. Yeah. And I think we as a society have to sit back and say, what is it to be a successful person? Yeah. And we start thinking that it's about profession, accumulation of wealth. But right. 
being a successful person is being able to feel safe with another person. And if we really emphasize that, then I think life would be a lot different for everyone. And easier and softer and kinder. Right. But again, we have to contextualize that in the world that we're in. And yeah. we realize that the world we're in says if people feel safe, they won't work. They'll be lazy. <laughs> and, <laughs> so true. And this is They're too happy, right? <laughs> well, it's so disrespectful to the natural creative impulses and urges that we have to learn and to really go to new boundaries. We're an exploratory species we want to discover, yeah. but we only feel bold enough, strong enough, and safe enough when we have good relationships to go into those areas. That is such a profound statement. I mean, when you really apply that to all of the world problems, mm. um, if we don't have each other to feel mm. that we can problem solve together, mm. we can't face these really emergent problems that we need to solve yeah. with our but, higher mind. Well, the interesting part, there is a evolutionary biologist by the name of Theodore Dobzinski. And uh, he's, his quote goes something like this. It's like, um, Survival of the fittest had to do with the ability to cooperate is really the gentle side of mammals. Their ability to cooperate enabled mammals to survive. And I think our concept of survival of the fittest is corrupted with the notion of physical strength. And that's not what evolutionary biology will tell you. It tells you that communication, cooperation uh, mm. enables species to enable mammals to survive. Because mammals were basically food for reptiles when they first came on the planet. They were small and they had to communicate with each other to develop both strategies to defend themselves, but they also had to know whether their conspecific, their own species, was safe enough to come close to. And I want to emphasize this part because this pulls a lot of these points together. How did they know they were safe enough to come close to? How do you know that another person is safe for you to come close to? The evolutionary story of mammals is that it was through intonation of vocalizations mm -hmm. because the nerves that regulate the, the larynx and pharynx, meaning the nerves that regulate vocal, intonation of vocalizations, interact in the brainstem with the nerves that regulate our autonomic nervous system mm -hmm. so that when we're calm, our voice has prosodic intonation. It has, it's melodic. But yeah. when we're not safe, when we're in fight flight, the voice goes to a narrower frequency band and often higher. Yeah. And so what happens when you're upset? How do you talk to another person? Mm -hmm. And often we don't, like I don't know that my voice has changed, but my husband does. Oh, and yeah. one of the oh, things right. since we've done this protocol is that we're letting each other know, like, um, can you use a softer voice that's activating me? And it's so non-judgmental and, and, and yeah. it's just wonderful, really, because then you can be aware, oh, I didn't even know I was using a, a, a tone or, um, or that it was tight. There's a tightness sometimes. Yeah, Th that tightness is a... Uh, 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 basically conducts anxiety. I call it leaking. The anxiety <laughs> leaks. Yes. And, and don't tell me you're not anxious. Don't tell me. It just mm. creates the space. Yeah. And it's an awareness that we have receptors for this. And we can't always get rid of our anxiety or our mm. needs, but we can be respectful that our feelings are being projected in, into the life space of other people. Mm. And and this is part of, I think, one of the important messages that we can't always feel great, nor should we always feel great. Right. But when we don't feel good, we have to understand that we have to be respectful of what we may be doing to others. Yeah, and also we can help each other because, you know, like... Um, if I grew up, and I did, in a home where I was anxious all the time for my survival, mm -hmm. so I now have a language where if my voice changes, my husband can say, like, are you okay? Mm -hmm. You know, like, he can help me, too. Yeah. It isn't like, you know, like, it isn't like I have to behave. It's that I'm allowed to have my experience, and there's a language to begin to talk about it. It's not just the language. The upper part of the face often conveys what the words or the intonations are, are conveying. So I actually, in my talks now, I, I, 
I have, there's a song that Alison Krauss sings. I don't know the composer, but it's when, uh, when there's nothing to say. You may know the next line is the smile on your face. Oh. It basically uh, tells me everything. Yes. And it's very polyvagal. And I play that. And then there's another song, which is, you can get it on YouTube. It's actually called Polyvagal, and I had nothing to do with it. But it's written by, obviously, uh, it's written uh, by a songwriter by name of Alice uh, Minguez. And it's extremely profound in its lyrics and even in its um, uh, intonation. It is really, the first line is, when uh, trust... Uh, was violated from the cradle. Okay, so it starts from wow. the very beginning. Yeah. And then it says, I can't move, someone help me get me out of here. And so it's all the images of a person going into uh, an immobilization, shutting down response, and put into music. So it's not a song to enjoy, but it's a song to honor and respect. Yeah. Because this is this person's... Uh, uh, really capacity to convey in lyrics and in music her feelings. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I found it online and uh, I actually contacted her and asked permission to use it. Uh, so I suggest, you know, uh, the words, the words are going to be triggers to other people. So, yeah. we, but also understand that it's that also the sharing of the experience is healing. Well, and we'll get the link from you and we'll put it in this video so people can listen to it. Because I think it'll um, help people that have experienced it feel like, oh, okay, that's, I know what that is. Yeah. Well, the, the interesting world of trauma or traumatology for me was that so many people feel that their experiences are unexplainable and unique and that use the terms, they think they are crazy for having these. And what you start seeing is that they almost follow a script driven by nervous system or physiological state, that yeah. their bodies just getting into these states, these are the emergent properties that are going to come out. And explaining that to people has a top-down healing capacity property because what it enables people to do is to understand their feelings, their behaviors in a rational way. They're seeing their body as adapting, uh, defensively adapting to the challenges. Yes. And, and they become respectful of their body's responses. And yeah. as they get respectful, it then becomes contained. Yeah. And, and you can trust your body. Oh, it means something. I'm not just doing this for no reason. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, like it's intelligent. Oh, you, it's very intelligent. And mm. it's the rest of the world, it's not. You know, the body <laughs> is telling you, survive. It's, yeah. I, I shifted it to a quest for safety rather than a quest to survive. Because survival is really getting rid of threats. But that's not our goal in life. Our goal in life is to be safe, which is different. Yes. So we live in the world of saying, get rid of threat, get rid of threat, carry more guns. Right. But our nervous system says that's not what we, it's about. We want people to smile at us, to be reciprocal with us, to be yes. close to us and make us feel good. Yes. Yeah. And, and I see uh, when you talk about guns and the guns in the schools and, and all of that, I, I see these videos where the teachers are shaking hands or high-fiving every child that walks in the door and they're talking about how this really changes the classroom mm -hmm. environment um, because the children feel connected and, and mm -hmm. To the, to the teacher. Yeah. I, wanted, I wanted to ask just for a minute, like, um, Amy, I'm wondering where, what, where you're at in all of this as the discussion goes, and that we really wanted to um, spend some time talking about some specific things about the protocol yeah. so that both that yeah. people can begin to understand what it is, yeah. and also maybe if they're doing it or have done it, uh, and they have some questions we can answer some of that because mm -hmm. I think there's also an ongoing maintenance issue around this. So, oh, yeah. but, but I just want to check in and see, Amy, you've been quiet and is there, where are you at? I'm just curious. I've been trying to write down things so I wouldn't interrupt. Um, <laughs> so one of the things that comes up for me is this idea that we have this really adaptive experience of survival and um, then what happens is, or at least with clients that I work with, is they say, it's no longer working for me. 
And so then what do I do? And so that's how we sort of begin to talk about polyvagal theory and how do we begin to shift this in an adaptive way. Mm. And for me, that's where the SSP protocol can come in for some of my clients. So let, let me back off a little bit. And mm -hmm. SSP is safe and sound protocol, which is this uh, computer altered vocal music that's played. But let's go back to the first word of the protocol, safe. Yes. which is almost a serendipitous labeling of the protocol because if it's not delivered in an environment that is supportive and safe, it mm -hmm. will work or will work as well because our body looks for cues of safety. Now with children, it's relatively easy because you have a caring parent or caregiver and a caring therapist and you take the child to the clinic, they go through it and they then leave. But if an adult goes in for uh, the safe and sound protocol, they often will drive there by themselves, go there by themselves, and they'll get a physiological reaction to listening to the music. And then they have to get out and drive their car again. So their bodies can recoil and they may not be prepared for the accessibility uh, that the acoustic stimuli will, will create. So that's the next part is the, what, what, what is this music? Why does it do these things? Uh, I want you to think of it as the distilled essence of safety. So, and the metaphor is how does a mother calm her crying baby? She does it with uh, vocalizations, intonation. How does, and I'm going to use this, I said the mother with the baby, and now I'll say the father with his dog. Yeah. <laughs> okay, the father, what type of voice will he use with the dog? A really sweet. It's really sweet with lots of intonation, higher pitch, mimicking in a way what the mother is doing to the baby. Fathers often have difficulty talking to their children that way, let alone their spouses, because they have a different role or they think they have a different role. And that role is often linked to discipline and boundary setting. But with their dog, they care less about boundary setting. They want the love and the relationship. So the intonation of vocalizations is something our nervous system cannot turn off. And it basically makes us vulnerable to, to trust. And this is very positive, but if you have a trauma history, it also becomes a trigger. Because when you have a trauma history, usually or often the trauma was, uh, is related to a violation of trust of someone close to you. Mm -hmm. And that meant that your body was in this accessible state of safety and you were now hurt. Now, the body is, as I said, very smart. The nervous system is very protective. And it really is saying, once hurt, I'm not going to get hurt again. And in fact, the clients may start telling you this. They might say, I'd love to have a relationship. I'd love to be hugged by another person. But when I get close, my body recoils. Yeah. Okay, so it's really saying there's a separation between the body's defenses and their intentionality. And that's, so what SSP does is it goes in at, the, at a really low brain stem level and it basically sends the triggers that you're now safe. And the question is, how do you deal with this? So when you deal with people who have severe trauma histories, it has to be slowed up a lot. And that was really part of our earlier uh, discussion offline that yes. it has to be slowed up a lot because the body has to get used to it. May I ask too that like, so um, I'm wondering for folks that have a more sensitive system, could it be every other day? Could yeah. it be, in other words, like what kind of, so, um, so, so, and still be useful? Okay. There are people, there are practitioners out there who have used it one day a week and get effects. Mm -hmm. But the part now that we want to really emphasize is that it's uh, incumbent on the therapist to be observant of the client. Mm -hmm. So when we say is 10 minutes too much or 30 minutes too much, the therapist has to be engaged with the client to be aware of whether the features of the client, mm -hmm. they can't just say, come back in an hour, let me know how you feel. Right. You, you have to now see, can your body, how, how is your body responding to this? What's your narrative of the feelings? 
So I'm going to shift the metaphor because not everyone who will be watching this uh, will will have uh, basically accepted what we've talked about. But if I use another metaphor or understood what we've talked about, I said that your nervous system is waiting for Johnny Mathis. (laughs) Yes. Now, it means more to my generation than to yours because Mm -hmm. uh, Johnny Mathis records when I was... uh, I use the term coming of age, were records that were put on to make young adolescent males and females feel safe with each other. Yes. You didn't have to say anything because the music did it. Mm. And everyone knew what the music was for. So yes. when I give my talks, if they're age appropriate people, they say, Oh, we like to listen to Johnny Matt. I said, yeah, What were you doing? <laughs> <laughs> You know, you know, I love this too. I had a, I, just a Johnny Mathis story. I had a young man come into my office with his parents and he was um, cusping on a psychosis um, related to a lot of things. And his parents talking a lot were, was making him really agitated. So I had them leave the room because he's pacing, right? And yeah. he's getting really ramped. And I turned on Johnny Mathis and we just sat there and he just went, that's right. You know, we didn't talk. We just listened to Johnny Mathis, and and it helped yeah. it so that he could come back together and you know, feel it, better. It, it's so biological, and this becomes even more in terms of the adolescent exploration. Uh, when we say we're accessible, we pull our arms back and we talk about the ventral side. And for mammals, the ventral is always protected because it's a vulnerable side. But what did Johnny Mathis do? It basically lit. <laughs> open <laughs> open and so there's a neurobiology behind it and this is really uh whether we talk about lullabies or johnny mathis that there's enough clues regarding the acoustic stimuli to trigger uh the sense of safety and then what the ssp does is actually amplifies the intonation shifts or prosody um so it's like saying you may talk with a prosodic voice and that triggers part of your brain but if i take those intonations and i run it through algorithms i can amplify the transitions more and your brain says i can't stop it it's coming in Mm -hmm. and that was the whole agenda of it it was really to say can you get this can you trigger this system and what are the consequences and you see a series of things occurring you see changes in the upper part of the face you hear changes in the voice you see people spontaneously engaging, which are all these clues that this autonomic state is now moving into a state of safety. Yes. And it's really quite remarkable. Yes. I had this 42-year-old adult, uh, after going through, this is back in the late 90s when I was developing this. He goes through the five, I mean, he, he would talk to people at a 90-degree angle. You know, he wouldn't make eye contact. Well, after the fifth hour, I walk in and he reaches out and says, hi, Dr. Porges. Oh, <laughs> and this was not a behaviorally <laughs> induced change. Right. So it wasn't like he was rewarded or reinforced for that. This right. was the spontaneous engagement that came out. Yes. And the sweetness in the person was now able to express itself. Did he notice the difference? No. Oh, so this is the, the important thing. We kept interviewing him because he was so intelligent. And he would remark about that he could he could look at other people and it felt fine. He could describe that. Mm-hmm. And he, when I asked him, this is what I was saying earlier, uh, uh, how he felt. He didn't have a word for it. He just kind of stumbles. He says, more relaxed. Mm-hmm. Now, I had a similar situation with um, another uh, individual whose child is on spectrum. And his child was listening to the Safe and Sound Protocol and came back and spoke to his father. And the child said, time has slowed up. Now, wow, what, those, what those clues give you is that what the father had said is that the major problem was his anxiety. Mm-hmm. And when you, if you're not, what is anxiety? Time is just crushing on you when yeah. time slows up. Now, there's another interesting thing with people with trauma histories. If you ask them a question like, how do you uh, experience stillness? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, you you know, so for the more uh, typical person, stillness is this time expanding 
and you know you're in control and you can go different places and do things in your mind but stillness to a person with a trauma history is that greatest vulnerability it's falling into that abyss yes. and they then have to mobilize but yeah, it it's stillness you. without someone there it's mm-hmm. a very it's a it's a morbid kind of stillness versus yeah. that reverie of being with in that yummy yeah. place yeah well it's falling into i call it falling into the abyss so yes. stillness is falling into the abyss and falling into the abyss is loss of purpose as well you 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 don't want to even be alive and so those become what i view as uh kind of uh projective ways of understanding where people are Mm -hmm. the other one is accessibility versus vulnerability so when you deal with people with trauma histories the most important thing is not to be vulnerable but if they're not vulnerable it can't be accessible. Yes. <laughs> and so it's not negotiable. It's a, it's a state. So if you feel yeah. good within yourself, you're accessible. Yes. And I talk about this from being an academic because academics are never allowed to be vulnerable because that's the life. It's a 24-7 right. uh, evaluative world. So mm-hmm. most academics are not very accessible. Therefore, what they want to convey can never really be conveyed. So wow. you start getting it's into the trap. Terms. Really, it's mm-hmm. a real trap. But it's a trap that anyone or everyone is in when they feel threatened, and if yep. they're chronically threatened. Now think think about children in our educational system. It's chronic threat. Yeah. So they're in that state of not being accessible, not being uh, safe enough in the environments. Yes. So I wonder, um, could you just talk a little bit about the sensation of coming online? Because I think that some of us have a negative response, like we start to get a defended Mm. response, right? But also sometimes it's not defended, but it's very novel. Mm. Uh, So that for people doing the protocol, what can they expect their body to be doing that might be unusual or they won't understand? What's well, happening? I, I, I've heard uh, all kinds of things coming back. And one was there was a detoxification. Yep. Because it was interesting. What, what that meant was also there was an effect in their digestive system. There was a cleansing going through. Uh, part of what it's supposed to do is to make the nervous system do what, it's, what it should do. So let me kind of explain that. So... It means that we should become aware of others around us. We should be uh, sensitive. We pick up cues from others. Those are the engagement parts. Our muscle tension shouldn't be always going into a a fight flight. But when we start talking about below our diaphragm, this is where people have their pain. And even in terms of with, with people who are, can impact on sexual function and that's where that's where trauma kind of like resides below the diaphragm mm. and so when it goes online in in a sense the gut should not be you shouldn't feel it now so it's the it's it's like this you want to feel your body but you're not feeling your gut so it's like your gut now becomes comfortable and doing its job it, it's we want to keep certain things in kind of like an automatic pilot one is yeah. digestion and bodily functions but when we're under high levels of stress, those systems are not on underlying on automatic pilot. They're giving us cues that we've done something that's not supportive of their tasks in life. So I think, you know, it, I'm, I'm watching uh, and I keep hearing. I had some very interesting uh, uh, letters back from psychiatrists and psychologists who went through it. Uh, basically, I would say did everything wrong in uh, the, the they did it on their own. They did it at home. They didn't have anyone around them. Right, right. And and Ugh. what it does is it creates tremendous vulnerability because their bodies now went into states of of needing someone there, and there was no one there. Yeah. And and uh, it, one one psychiatrist, which is a very interesting story, because she wrote me a twenty seven page single space letter. <laughs> she of, had a lot to tell you. <laughs> well, she had a lot to tell me about the transitions she went through, she went through it three times. Mm. The first two times, it was really extraordinarily disruptive. Yeah. Um, but she was also a therapist who had to take 
anti-anxiety drugs before her first client every morning. Oh. And she had a young daughter. And so at the end, she goes to the third time, this is what she writes to me. She says, I don't need to take the uh, anti-anxiety drugs. That's good. She says, I now, I now, but here's even better. I now, uh, can it, I now see humor in my child's antics. Oh. She said, I understand why people like music now. So, mm. so say coming online, she was coming online. Yeah. And, and all these features were coming out and they were really like, wow, life is interesting. Life is fun. And wow. for many of us who, you know, I would say don't suffer from or, or haven't had those experiences. Yeah. I used to say everyone comes from a messed up family. But as I've gotten older, I realize there are gradations yeah. in what can be called messed up. Mm-hmm. And I've started to hear these journeys that people have been on in terms of survival the heroic journeys yeah. and it just i mean all i have is you know i have great this uh great respect i also start having gratitude for the world and life that i've had yeah. as opposed to as we say complaining about everything which yes. is part of the human nature as well <laughs> um, yeah. but but we what you what in the world of trauma you start learning really about the survival instincts the power of survival or desire to survive that people have and how they have adjusted to it unlike many of the people in traumatology i don't come from a trauma history many of the trauma therapists have trauma histories and so what that also means is that when they start discussing these cases it can be triggers to them Mm -hmm. Uh, for me i don't come from that history and it just kind of expands my respect and understanding of, of what it is to be a human. So I'm basically yeah. learning a lot about these things. Yeah. Have you seen parents feel better in general in the family? Because part of what I often am noticing is how do I help the whole family system come online? Mm-hmm. So a children, a child's often symptomatic mm-hmm. of marital distress and just gen- in general, the family environment is just not very safe. I would reverse it a little bit. I would reverse the impact of a, of a atypical child does on the family unit. Um, okay. So like a child on spectrum will not be engaging mm-hmm. and, even though mothers tend to be more tolerant of the child's atypical behavior, fathers get extraordinarily upset, often get depressed and even suicidal because they don't have a son. They feel really, especially if it's a boy. And so when a child starts to become interactive with the family, with the father, the family doesn't really care anymore whether there's a learning disability or they just care that they now have a a child. It's a really interesting experience to watch these things change within the individual. Right. Yeah. Yes. It's like part of your comments make me think about just how hard it's also on mothers not to get that reciprocity and the mm-hmm. burden, the feeling of burden. And so they slowly start to feel more and more heavy. But what you're bringing up, this is just like we talked about with the HIV caregivers, uh, that and we can see this even with Alzheimer's, the same thing where people are, are are caregiving, but they're burnt out. But they're not really burnt out. They're not getting anything in return. Yeah. And it's that reciprocity that the nervous system is looking for. I was just thinking, um, in addition to um, autistic children, even children with explosive behaviors or really intense emotions or sensory processing disorder, children who are gifted, they all. You know, there's so much coming at these children that I could see how it's this feedback loop where the parents are, un- mm. are not sure, like, this isn't what we expected and that reciprocity that you were speaking. Yeah. This is, by the way, with preterm babies, it's the same thing. Yeah. And the history with preterm babies was, it, uh, was that when parents would come into the hospital, they see this thing they couldn't identify with this preterm immobile child Mm -hmm. and then they were often left and abandoned as wards of the state but what they're now doing is having much more interactions with the preterm and learning about the uniquenesses of the behavioral repertoire of even preterm babies and of course the bonding and the development's coming much better but it's this violation of reciprocity Mm -hmm. 
that makes it very difficult for family units to stay together. Yes. And that goes back to what you said about that top-down learning. When the parents are then educated about it, they can then cope with it more. Cope with it more. It still doesn't make it easy. No, it's not easy. Yeah. Well, what I often say, it's not easy with typical children. So, you know, and there's always right. a lot of, <laughs> right. lot of non-contingencies going on there. But you have an understanding of what the nervous system needs. Yeah, it's it's like interesting too because when I have parent, I usually have parents try to do the protocol first. I at first I had them do it at the same time with the child, but actually it's such a big experience that that was a little too much. Mm. So now I have the parents do it first, and one of the things that um, often parents will be aware of is just the pain of having been a parent in this environment and just like the lack of reciprocity and the the way that their body is so hurt and tender uh, so they get this other experience you know of dropping down into safety mm. and i think it also helps them do the protocol with the child in a way that doesn't have so much urgency, mm -hmm. uh, you know, cause there's a lot of urgency around getting these behaviors to stop, you know, because they're so hard. Mm -hmm. I well, was wondering, I, Oh, go ahead. But let me just kind of respond. Yes. If, if you have the parents doing it first, especially the mothers in most cases, yeah. uh, the mother becomes more resilient mm -hmm. and, and sends different cues to this child. So the mother is already becoming a vehicle of the intervention. That's beautiful. The, the, the issue for in terms of listening to what you're saying, though, is that a lot of people have difficult life histories. Yeah. And they, so the parent may have buried some of their traumas and they may start coming out. But if you're a trauma-informed therapist, the SSP is helpful as a tool giving you something to work with and bringing it back to a, a consciousness and mm -hmm. enabling the client to develop that narrative of understanding of self and then a narrative of understanding of their child. Yeah. yeah I, I imagine a lot of therapists are going to be interested in this um, just because there's times when you're working with families where you can feel very stuck. You get into a place where um, there's just not shifts and I've seen this really allow there to be an opening and a and more movement uh, for the parent to be able to really receive uh, more from the therapy yeah. take yeah. greater risk you know for more vulnerability <laughs> and like really be able to hang on to the learning too it's almost like I sort of think the SSP, SSP is kind of like a window mm -hmm. it sort of opens things yeah. and then like then it's this opportunity for something to happen different than history uh, so I actually it was designed it's my model of portal, so the window is perfect. So uh, the acoustic channel was a portal to get into that brainstem area that regulated the, what I call the integrated social engagement system, but it really means the muscles of your face and head that you use to engage and also to ingest. So one of the features that you haven't mentioned is that children who are fussy eaters mm. start becoming more exploratory in what they're eating because eating is a way of regulating state. It's not the most efficient. And because it's using the same muscles that we use for social engagement. Yeah, I've actually also seen that children have a greater idea of satiety, like they sense yeah. when they're full yeah. and they don't, so that they, you know, that kind of anxious hunger that isn't really about real hunger. Yeah. I know that Amy's done this a lot with kids. Um, what kind of stuff have you seen, Amy? Um, like what kind of results? Because I know parents will want to know, like what right. can this uh, affect? So the um, some of the children I've worked with, they're more able to, so if I step back a little bit, um, children who get like sensory overload, and so then they act out or they run or they hide or they hit someone, those behaviors begin to go away because their neuroception or their sort of lower brainstem perception of what's going on changes. And instead of perceiving fear and I have to protect myself, they begin to feel more engaged and they can tell their classmate, I don't like that. Or they can physically just get up and move 
in a way that feels normal instead of uh, overexcited or fearful. Um, that's some of the more profound things. A young child who was about to get kicked out of school, his behaviors went away. He was more engaged. He was better able to learn from his teachers and get feedback from his teachers. And then, of course, the things going on at home shifted between mm. uh, a sibling and the parents. And then one of the most profound things I found for one of the parents I worked with was they stopped being so reactive to their child, sort of, you know, children can be pretty flaily mm. <laughs> with their arms. And so it's normal to kind of flinch, but it wasn't a constant. It was more um, like what Dr. Porges said of that appreciating the antics and having humor yeah. around and that humor showed up so much more easily. I, and when I witnessed it in the room, I was like, oh, this is, like, it's, it felt beautiful to witness it. Mm -hmm. and it wasn't even in their awareness, the shift, until I brought it up. And they were like, oh, yeah, I didn't even notice that. That's a stunning piece, too, that I wonder about, is that I see all these changes that are really incredible, but, like, the parent will see the changes in the child. Another adult will see the changes in their spouse. Everyone sees changes. Except, like, it's harder to see the, like, I think you start to get an idea of internally, it, but. It's very hard. Certain things are so fluid in our own behaviors that we don't see ourselves as causal. So when, uh, yes. so I, <laughs> guilty. But other, <laughs> but other people. So I was. Um, there was a group uh, that had a. Uh, they had a whole group of of uh, people. There was another therapy they were learning, and they did uh, the SSP as part of their training. And I went and I talked to them in a group. And one person said, I, I didn't see much happening. Okay. So I then asked the people around, uh, did you see anything change in her? And they said, oh, yeah, she would never have been even, uh, she would never have said anything. <laughs> she would never have done, this, <laughs> never have done that. Uh, but it, it, the behavior becomes so natural mm -hmm. of the engagement that people don't know that it's occurring. And frequently, even parents and spouses don't see it until it's lost. So I would be work with many uh, children who were on spectrum, and they were making these really amazing changes, and which were in a sense making them more typical. And the parents would just kind of like say, "Oh, that's you know, that's what he does all the time, more or less," which wasn't true, until the kid got a cold. When he gets a cold or a fever, a lot of these things drop out, and suddenly. The phone's ringing and say, can you, can, can you fix them again? Yes. Yeah. And yes. so it's a, there's fluidity in how we detect these things. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very difficult to be a trained observer of self uh, to realize those physiological shifts mm -hmm. in oneself. Yes. I also think some of it too is that when parents have been so chronically um, under stress with a child that might be neurodivergent, that they're not able to see cues of safety as easily. So they may not, you know, sometimes it takes them a while to titrate mm -hmm. and to get an experience. Although I would say in general, most of the children that have done this, I've seen really profound responses mm -hmm. where they're, they're laughing, they're singing, they can tolerate transitions. That's a big one. They can navigate yeah. and tolerate transitions. They don't tantrum as long or as often. Um, more eye contact, more hugging, like, it's pretty beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, it, you know, it, it, it's an enabler of what it is. I'm like, how do I want to phrase this? It enables us to be who we are. Yes. It's, it's, so another metaphor is it takes the wrapping or container away and you find and see the core. And the interesting part is the core of most people, just truly wonderful. Yes. And that many of these children are treated like they're bad kids. Yeah. And really, they're good kids who are trying desperately to survive in the world because they're in states of defense. And we have to understand that yelling at them is not the way out, but getting their physiological state to change is. Yeah. And that's what this is through that window, or I call it portal. Yeah. Yes, and it goes, it really um, is such a huge paradigm shift from reward and punishment was the operant conditioning of my history growing up and a lot of parents, you know, so like, like, 
parenting from a perspective of safety is mm -hmm. a big shift. It's it's beautiful. Beautiful. Think of education mm -hmm. from a safety perspective. Mm. Mm. Or lack of safety perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Currently. Yeah. Well, it's hard. It's hard. See, mm -hmm. it's hard in education because education paradigms are totally either cognitive or behavioral. And in fact, they're merged. So people think that uh, disorders can be changed through uh, uh, behavior modification and rewards can change cognitive function. And really, it has a lot to do with what state you're in which is not, I make sure we're not talking about geographical state. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> nervous state, nervous state. Yeah, yeah. Right. And I think talking to parents and teachers and other adults about that neurological or neurobiological state is a key part to them better understanding their children yeah. and their students. Yeah. Well, it gives them, uh, and part of it, they have to understand that when they have had a bad day and when they get worked up, uh, they're difficult to deal with as well. So in a sense of reflecting on oneself as opposed to projecting on the other. That can be really hard. <laughs> well, it's hard because we've all experienced it. Right. And, and that's part of what it is. And it, it to, to in a sense understand that when we are triggered by another person's behavior, it's still not justification to be defensive and aggressive back on that person. And that's hard. It's hard to learn. Yes. It's hard to implement. But that's part of our responsibility. We have to be, that has to be an adult in the room. Yes. So would you say using this SSP listening protocol can help parents with that triggered response? Well, it can be, SSP can get us into states of feeling safe if we have the appropriate support around us. Yeah. When we're in states of safety, we have resilience. Yeah. And now everything unfolds from there. We have flexibility, we have resilience, we have compassion, and we have greater sensitivity to others without being hypersensitive sensitive to to like sounds in the room or lights. You know, the basic sensory domains don't bother us as much. Yeah. Um, there are even uh, feedback from SSP where people had tinnitus where it didn't take it away, but it doesn't bother them as much. Yeah. Mm. Right. That's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I've had people have a uh, sort of a tinnitus response with it where the ear was clicking and they got a uh, sour taste. So sometimes there's a, a period yeah. of time of disruption. And I, some people have heard two to six weeks and then things get better. I'm wondering okay. what so, your thoughts so are. The, it's really a good sign if they start getting the itching in their ear. Mm. because it means that the bones and the muscles are contracting okay. and it's doing what it's doing. Okay. But they might not have accessed those muscles uh, since they were infants. So, oh, wow. uh, so wow. you're getting a retuning of the system and the body has to resolve it. Um, so it's a lot of individuals you'll find out if you do clinical histories, they have chronic ear infections and they are hypersensitive to sounds which really means that the neural regulation of the middle ear structures didn't recover from the ear infections. And it just made them uh, had difficulty, difficulty in processing verbal commands, auditory uh, processing. And they were treated as if this was a brain damage or a permanent dysfunction. Yeah. They were treated as if they weren't paying attention. And the system's now coming back on board. But when it comes on board, it's using muscles that have been used in a long, long time, and those muscles will get fatigued. And the person, the feedback from the from tired middle ear muscles, since they're fast twitch muscles, is the person might get exhausted. You might have feedback of individuals by the third session that uh, they're, they're really exhausted. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, I have. <laughs> yeah. But that's a very positive clue that the system's being recruited. Mm. But the exhaustion, the exhaustion after day three was the, if they had exhaustion after day three, I said, good outcome. Yeah, <laughs> it's day four and five that actually the more it gets a little mm, more intense, I would say. And yeah. some people can't tolerate the whole hour, even though they've been able to do one through three. It, it just yeah. has a bigger impact. And well, with the with on spectrum kids, it was usually after day three 
you could see big, you could see the big changes. Um, but when you start dealing with people with more complex histories, mm -hmm. you're opening up portals of sense of sensory processing. So days four and five have a greater range of sensory input, mm -hmm. and that's what you may be reacting to. Yes, there was a word you used. That partly, I'm trying to help people understand why you wouldn't want to take this machine home and use it. And I was using the concept of memory reconsolidation, which is an idea that says that when you have a traumatic response, if there's a safe helper yeah. who accepts you unconditionally, then you um, are able to take that experience of safety and it, it gets inserted into the memory, mm. the traumatic memory, and dilutes it. But you had another way of thinking uh, about it. I was curious. Yeah, I, I talk about it as changing the personal narrative. Yeah. You change the story. And how does a helper do that? Like, can, how do you see that? Well, if you're, if you're in a safe state, your neuroception of even memories changes. And so what happens with traumatic memories is that the anticipation of the trigger, the trigger is really a trigger of anticipation. And sometimes the trigger has more power than the exposure to the actual stimulus, the person, the place. Yeah. So, so it's really saying, I need to get myself away from this. And what the helper does, or the chain narrative, it says it contains the response. It says, you're here with me, and you can experience this, it's not so bad. Ah, uh, yeah, you can yeah. stay in it. Yeah, and that's actually, you know, mm -hmm. there are therapeutic models like somatic experiencing mm -hmm. that work on that type of model. Yes. But SSP provides, it's not, it's not the treatment, it's not a complete intervention. It's a tool mm -hmm. that can be used for other interventions. Mm -hmm. So SSP can be used with any of these therapies and you get your safe helper, your supportive helper within Basically, it's, setting, it's creating the setting conditions for safety to come into your world. Imagine if our clients came to us already in a higher state of safety, right? Yeah. And that's kind of what it does, is it helps get that sense of safety up a little higher than yeah. well, otherwise more sessions. Absolutely. What one therapist said to me was that the SSP reduced therapy by at least six months. And actually, what she said even more, but let's just say six months, because it got people to engage on a level that they couldn't before. Yeah, and I think about um, a lot of therapy is very verbally predominant, right? Mm -hmm. And I think therapists are coming up with all sorts of s supporting ways of working, uh, somatic experiencing being one that doesn't rely so heavily on verbalization. Mm -hmm. um, but for those of us that are in a state of defense, um, verbalization is flooding, it's taxing. You know, I've, um, you know, again, o over the years, I start discounting um, verbalization or the actual words and think it's much more important about how voice is used and how the relationship is used with the in verbal interactions. Uh, and we can even go back to the notion about arguments where we start the whole interview. Um, if you have an argument, no one wins. But if you want to make a point, you better start engaging in a more appropriate way. So you're sharing moments. I, I think what we're all talking about for therapies to work or for society to be more supportive is for more shared experiences. Mm -hmm. And so what is therapy and what is SSP attempting to do? It's attempting to make your experience similar to my experience. Mm -hmm. And what we continue to do in a therapeutic model or a relationship model is we're trying to say, I experience this, are you, what are you experiencing? And can we minimize the differences between our experiences? Yes, I, I think about it as um, sort of, this isn't the right word, but there's a sense of <laughs> telepathic kind of sharing. Yeah. You know, it's that's kind of a woo-woo term, and it's not maybe the best word, but there's a sense that when there's greater safety, in, in mm -hmm. like in the therapeutic experience, um, I feel the other person mm -hmm. more easily, and they feel me feeling them, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. And you begin to have sort of like less boundary conditions around... Mm -hmm 
where thoughts arise from or experiences. It's more like a co-experiencing. Mm. Well, this is what neuroception is all about, at least neuroception of safety. We don't know all the receptors. So when you say you feel the energy of the person right. or you feel this intimacy, we don't know where and what is being felt. We just have this kind of shared experience. Mm -hmm. So I like to talk about um, safety as providing those moments of intimacy. And what I mean by intimacy, it's really shared moments. Yeah. Uh, whether it's with a puppy or baby or your spouse, you know, yeah. you have this shared moment. Your bodies are conforming and you're, you know, you, so I show pictures of, of dogs and people, people, uh, you know, parents and their children and different mammals with each other. They all, you all see it in the same way. Everyone will see it in the same way. That there's a shared experience occurring between the two mammals. We are, we are mammals. <laughs> yeah. And we have this capacity, shared experience. And yes. And when we, in a sense, deconstruct the whole dialogue of our past hour, it's whether or not we have the opportunities to have shared experiences with each other. Because when we talk about uh, being threatened or being in states of defense, there is no shared experience, which means there's gap in communication. It's not just gaps in intellectual communication or cognitive yeah. communication. There are tremendous gaps in feelings, communicating feelings. Yeah. Yeah, as you talk about it, I can feel it. It's that place where um, I'm alone yeah. and I can't reach the other person. It's frustrating, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's the worst. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've all been there. Haven't we? And, and, and we don't like it. No. no. Because, because our bodies want a type of understanding, which is an acknowledgement and an acceptance of who we are in the space that we're in. Yes. What are some things we might do, which I know we had brought up, but then I think we missed it about bringing back that sense of safety. If our body moves from like down regulated to sort of over excitement, mm -hmm. in addition to sort oh. of telling them what to experience, but mm -hmm. then also how do we help them get back into that state of? I think there, there are going to be other toolkits that need to be available. One is teaching people how to breathe. Yeah. Because slow exhalation brings the vagus back on and down regulates the sympathetic. So telling a person to take a deep breath and exhale slowly mm -hmm. uh, has a profound calming effect. Uh, there are more uh, elaborate breathing technologies, but they should be used mm -hmm. and taught. And there are, of course, certain types of biofeedback where people start learning that their states are manifested in physiology. And I'm actually getting involved in redesigning equipment to do that. So, yeah. uh, so that will become part of what I think is a toolkit for therapists mm -hmm. where they can monitor the physiology of their clients and use that monitoring to teach their clients about their own shifts and states. Right. So they can see numbers to go with the feelings. Right. And the sensations. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's interesting. It's like a whole other realm of awareness around communication is mm -hmm. uh, being aware of one's physiological sensation. And so, so we're trying to put ourselves back in our body, and we, we are. have to figure out. Uh, it's not merely I touch or feel that I touch with the external, but I feel the feel inside myself, and that's where the measurements help. Mm -hmm. So we, we can have objective touching, and now we'll get objective feelings through the use of physiological monitoring. Mm -hmm. So it just enables an individual to map their own body in their narrative with more yeah. tools. There are some clients who all they can do is feel stuff in their body, and there are some clients who are like, what do you mean, what do I feel in my body? Right? <laughs> <laughs> and just yes. the idea that they want to is a little... Puts them a little bit off balance, even. Yeah. Well, it's amazing that, I mean, again, going back to earlier comments, it's amazing that people have succeeded as well as they do with the, I was going to use the term, I was going to use the term self imposed handicaps, but it's not really self imposed. In the, it's like their, their adaptive survival strategies have enabled them to succeed on one level, but yes. have contained their experiences on others. Yes. And that's your job is to you know, right. fix them the right way. 
<laughs> our, our job is to create safety so that those in natural oh. emergent properties oh, can you you're, <laughs> you you're smarter than I am yeah that, that, I, <laughs> that's it it's all natural and if you create the right conditions the body will do the rest the nervous system will do the rest I just wanted to say one other thing that I've just taken from your work that's so helpful is that <clears throat> we often will see when we're in argument or just, just not getting along or not, our children aren't behaving in ways we can tolerate or, or we're f having trouble in our marriage, is that sometimes we can have a belief that they're not trying or that they actually don't care about me. We, we develop a lot of narratives that sort of question the intention of the other person. And part of um, the work of the polyvagal theory that has just touched me so deeply is that we are all trying to be in relationship. Our nervous system is attempting to do that while also creating a sense of safety and that but that some of the behaviors that we have certainly are hard on our partner but the intention is to try to find a way mm -hmm. to to <clears throat> endure and to be with um, but some of our strategies are Wow. A little crazy making for the other person. But here, here's the paradox is the narrative is all based on the intention, not on the impact. So the narrative will always be, I'm trying my best. I'm doing what I think is best. And in doing that, the narrative results in an individual who's not listening mm -hmm. and or witnessing the other. So the, the issues, once you start to justify or go back to your intention, stop. Mm. Because once you're doing that, you already are in a defensive state and you're incapable yeah. of witnessing or listening. And it's the witnessing and listening that provide the setting conditions for feeling safe or the other person feeling safe because it diffuses the aggressive defensiveness. Mm. And we haven't learned that very well. Yeah, so the witnessing and the li listening, it's so, it's so profound to think I can help simply by well, presence and, and witnessing. Right. And you have to stop trying to fix. Mm -hmm. You see, <laughs> the intention is I have to fix that. Yeah. Forget that. Listen, respect, and you know, witness the person. Respect their feelings. Yeah. Um, I, I want to give them the most powerful metaphor for that is a, a survivor of rape. Where, where they are now forced to talk to the police and they want to get you know, documentation without witnessing and supporting the person who's experienced it. So the community is all about retribution and documentation. When the survivor's need is all about being witnessed and supported. Mm -hmm. And the uh, retribution and punishment is secondary because you have to support the person. And this is, in a sense, how we react to everything. We, we say we can fix it or we can mm -hmm. punish it. And right. we're not listening to really what the person is saying. I don't care if you punish the person. I need help. Yes, and just be with me in it. That's be right. in the experience with me yeah. so I can tolerate it and so I mm -hmm. can be in it. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. I so appreciate your time and for your work and for this real amazing gift, the protocol, really. I just am so excited to see where it evolves. I know you've got another edition of it. That yeah. you, you well, know, it's we're working on several other things with it. And, but first of all, I really appreciate your uh, embracing it and using it and going on the journey with me to discover what it can do because the feedback from, from you will be helpful in, uh, tailoring it for different types of, of clients. Yes. So thank you. It feels like a collaborative effort. Just yeah. from hearing your stories, just wonderful. Exactly what humans need, right? That collaboration. Right. And cooperation, right? right. <laughs> Trust. Trust. Yeah. Trust. So if you go back to the actual title of my talk was of my polyvagal theory was orienting in a defensive world, our mammalian modifications of, of our nervous system. I can't remember what the rest of the title of polyvagal theory was, but was how do we orient in a defensive world, in a dangerous world, how do we survive? And that's what polyvagal theory was about. How do we survive in a world that has dangers in it? And that's, yes. And but we have to find safety. It's not that we fight danger with, with greater threat. We don't, right. ramp, we don't ramp it up. We find pockets of safety. And that's what our nervous system is uh, 
is on the quest for. That is so fundamental. That is so fundamental. Well, thank you very much. And I enjoyed seeing the two of you again. Hope we see you again. Yes. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We appreciate your time. Thanks.